Let's pray together. God, the words of this song echo in our hearts. We love you. We are amazed that you would be called our God and that we could be called your people. The inestimable privilege of knowing you and being known by you. Just incalculable. And we thank you. We know that you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. For every single one whom you foreknew, you also predestined to be conformed to the image of your Son. And all those whom you predestined, you also called and justified and glorified. What will we say to these things, God? If you are for us, who or what could possibly be against us? You do not spare your own son, but delivered him over for us. How will you not also with Jesus freely give us all things? And who will bring a charge against your elect? You are the one who justifies. Who is the one who could condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at your right hand, who also intercedes for us. Who then will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long, considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, O oh God, even in death, even in suffering, even in tribulation, even in cancer, we overwhelmingly conquer through you because you have loved us. And, O oh God, if we have your love, we indeed have everything. All glory to you this morning. All praise be to you for who you are and for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning we have a treat. Uh, next week we have another treat. We'll get to jump back into the book of Romans and continue a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Paul's letter to the Romans. This morning we get to hear something by way of testimony of God's goodness and kindness. I know a number of you are here this morning because you heard that Matt and Cameron would be speaking and telling about God's grace in their lives. And we're just excited to hear from you. So Matt and Cameron do come up and share with us. Hello, everyone. It is so good to be back. It is only by God's goodness, goodness and kindness that we sit here today. Um, I mean, it is amazing what God has done. And we are here to give a testimony of God's goodness and kindness in our lives, as Smed was saying. Um, but before that, Cameron is going to give a summary of kind of, for those of you who don't know what's happened, of what, what the last several weeks have been. Okay, so as most of you know, um, we uh, were missionaries sent out by Grace Bible Church in 2014. So in November of 2014, along with two other families from our church, we were sent over to Papua New Guinea, um, and that's where we've been for the last two years, um, eventually living in a, in a village um, with the goal being to learn their language and write it down and eventually preach the gospel in that language. Um, but in September of last year, August, September, our oldest daughter started getting sick with tonsillitis, and so we decided to come back, um, both to get her a tonsillectomy and also to take an early, a short, a short break, a furlough. Um, so we were back here, and in January, Matt went in for what we thought was going to be more or less a routine MRI. That MRI revealed about a dozen tumors in his brain, which we later learned was metastasized lung cancer. Um, it's kind of a, a more rare mutated lung cancer because he's not a smoker. Um, 
So after that diagnosis, it was a, it was a strange place to be in. We, everything we owned was in Papua New Guinea. It still is in our house in the village in Papua New Guinea. And we didn't really have a place to live for our family. Um, and so God provided uh, incredibly in that period of time, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but we got moved into a home. And five days later, Matt, uh, one of the tumors in his brain began to bleed, which um, caused a stroke. So um, between about 4 a.m. and um, noon on that day, he lost everything on the left side of his body and became paralyzed um, because of that stroke. Um, the doctors over at Barrow were able to do sort of an emergency surgery, and, um, which was great. When he came out of that surgery, he was alive, but he was completely paralyzed on the left side of his body. Um, and then things kind of got worse because while he was in the ICU, the cancer had pretty much won in his brain with the stroke and had um, be began to win also in his body. His blood started to go into this low-grade DIC thing, which is where your blood causes excessive clotting. Um, the only way to treat that, about 10 to 50% of patients, when their blood begins to do that, they actually don't make it. So um, the only way to treat that is to treat the underlying cause, which in this case was cancer. So we were able, again, through just incredible provision, um, get a medicine, and five days after he began taking that medicine, all of his numbers began coming up. So it's kind of a miracle that we're even sitting here today. And they came up incredibly and are continuing to do so. So he was able to become stable and leave the ICU, um, but that really just began the recovery from the stroke. And so bit by bit, going from being completely paralyzed on his left side, God has restored just bit by bit everything back to him almost. So we're still in that process that kind of leads us to where we are today from being transfused every 24 hours in the ICU um, to him just, you know, on, on oxygen and, and to him being here today. And so we are so thankful to be here. Um, I mean, the ways that, that, that this church and our families and our friends and just people we don't even know have um, provided um, have been incredible. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that, that, that is what we have been through in the last two months. And, um, and we have learned a lot through that. So that is what we'll be talking about today. The, the last several weeks have been the hardest weeks of our lives, and God has sustained us through it all, um, God, and God has been so gracious to us. Um, so right now, I'm not going to preach a sermon, I'm going to give a testimony of God's grace in our lives, but my testimony has a title, and it has four points. <laughs> so I talked to Scott, and I was like, Scott, is it okay if my testimony has a title and four points? He never said anything, so I think it's okay. I would have, you would have said something, right? Um, so the title is Four Truths to Sustain a Dying Man. These are truths that God used in both of our lives, as Cameron and I had two very different views of this trial, you know, but these truths God used in our lives to sustain us. Before, before I get into it, I need to give a warning. So I am still recovering you know, mentally and physically from the stroke. And I have no idea how long I'm going to be able to talk for. My goal is to make it through all of this, but I have no idea. You know, like when I practiced this over the weekend, I mean, by the end, I was exhausted. So Cameron probably will read some of it for me. And I'm actually going to read it from here. I, was, I had plans to memorize it and just say it, but I had a stroke, you know? <laughs> Come on. I can't be expected to memorize stuff like this. <laughs> and so, so I'm going to read it. And that's better because then I won't forget to say things because, again, I had a stroke, right? And I already had a bad memory before I had the stroke. And so, like, and, and now it's even worse. And uh, so, anyways, so, okay, I'm going to get into it. Um, four truths to sustain a dying man. Number one, we have a hope in heaven. Number two, I will never suffer in this life as much as my Savior suffered for me. Number three, Christians love one another. And number four, God loves us. You know, these aren't like new truths. These are plain truths that you read in God's word. But they sustained us during this time. So the first truth that sustained me, the dying man, is we have a hope in heaven. 
Philippians 3, verses 20 through 21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. When I was in the ICU, when I was in the ICU, I knew that at one point that like, I was in bad shape, you know? I mean, I had a feeding tube in my nose. I, had, I couldn't speak. I couldn't laugh. I had no emotions. And, and my whole left side was paralyzed. And so I lay in that bed, and I just couldn't move, you know? And it was, it was so hard. It was, you know, it was so uncomfortable laying in a bed for hours and hours, and you just can't ever adjust yourself, right? And yet, as I lay there during that time, at like the bottom of the worst part of this, I just thought about this verse, and I thought, I have a citizenship in heaven. And it just sustained me, knowing that I have this hope in heaven. And it's so secure. You know, if you think about all the passages of Scripture that talk about heaven, it's like we have a citizenship in heaven, or we, we, and we have an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's not something that, like, is being prepared for us. It's there. We have it right now. And it's described in God's word as so much better than what, what this life is. You know, this life is so good. You know, we have friends, we have family, we have beautiful things. And yet God didn't save us just to have a better life here or to have a better life here. He saved us to himself. He saved us so that we can see him face to face one day. You know, and, I mean, we're going to be in heaven and see our creator. And just thinking about this, just thinking about this, when I was laying in that bed in the ICU, sustained me, the dying man. I mean, God is so good. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2 says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. You know, when I laid in that bed, I was groaning. As my earthly tent was being destroyed, I was groaning, longing to put on my heavenly dwelling. Um, Through all this, this truth, when I die, I will be with my Savior. That is my hope in heaven, and that is secure, has sustained me. And there, I tried to contemplate, you know, what heaven would be like during this time. I tried to, you know, think, how great is this going to be? And, you know, there is nothing else in all of creation that will be more enjoyable and amazing as worshiping and knowing our creator. Think about this. Is, this a, is that a true statement? I thought about it. I was like, is this true? Is, this, am I, is it really going to be this enjoyable to worship my creator? And so I tried to come up with analogies to, to like, compare it to, but all my analogies, analogies never really fully worked, right? You can go to the Grand Canyon, and it's like you're moved by just seeing the largeness of it and the beauty of it. And you can see a thunderstorm and just be awed by the power. And, you know, you can get goosebumps from the wind and the rain. And rain. And, if you, and we can try and comprehend space and, you know, just be flabbergasted by the immensity of it and the complexity of it. And yet God is more amazing than the Grand Canyon. He's more awe-inspiring than thunderstorm. He is more, we will never be able to comprehend him, but more than space. You know, this is the God who saved us to himself. And as I, as I lay in that hospital bed, I would just have thoughts like this and, about heaven and how we're, I'm going to be there. And it sustained me. I can truly agree with Apostle Paul throughout all this. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Everything's, everything said in the Bible about heaven only produces more hope and anticipation for us to be there. Heaven will be far greater than I can think or imagine. This sure hope in heaven of being with our glorious God sustained me, the dying man, throughout this trial and continues to do so today. Second truth. Everybody good? Am I speaking okay? All right. In my mind, I feel like I'm 
speaking weird. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, so just throw something at me, okay? If, if it gets weird. No, Susanna, don't do it. It's a joke. <laughs> the second truth that sustained me, this dying man, is I will never suffer as much as my Savior suffered for me. In order, in order to understand this point, you have to first understand one more statement. I am not getting what I deserve. Twelve weeks ago, we stood up here and we said, God is just and good in giving us this cancer. And, but why? It's because, you know, we don't deserve anything good in this life. We have sinned against a holy God, and we deserve wrath, eternal punishment from this holy God. So we don't deserve anything good, you know? There's no good people in this, wor- in this world. We are not good people. We don't deserve anything good. So, all my sins against the holy and good creator earned me an eternal punishment. Um, my rebellion against him was and is deserving of eternal death, but God in his kindness and mercy has actually given me eternal life. How has he accomplished this? And this is what brings us to this statement. I will never suffer as much as my Savior suffered for me because he bore my wrath, the wrath that I deserve, he took on the cross to save me from my sins. Jesus Because Jesus took that eternal punishment that my sins deserved when he died on the cross, I am not getting what I do deserve because Jesus took what he didn't deserve. He didn't deserve to be mistreated or beaten or spit upon or crucified or bear my sin and punishment, but he did it for me. He did it for every believer. Mark 10.45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When I was in the ICU, as I spoke about earlier, I was uncomfortable, and it was, I was so uncomfortable, it was almost to the point of anguish. It's hard to even describe. Talk to me more afterwards if you want to hear about it, all right? But it's not a good story. It's sad. Um, it was the worst time of my life, and yet my God for me was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my sins. He was nailed to a cross But even more, he bore all the wrath that I deserve. He took the punishment for me. Jesus suffered on the cross far more than I could ever suffer in this life. Even now, as I think about the future, you know, there's so many bad things that could happen. My doctor's here. He could tell you, you know. I I could ask him, like, what are all the bad things that could happen, Dr. Ploey? You know, but I don't actually want to hear the answer, you know. I mean, like, I have cancer still, right? It could keep growing or grow back. It's shrinking now, praise God. But, I mean, I got full brain radiation, which, you know, it saved my life, but they put radiation all over my brain. That doesn't sound good, right? I mean, the consequences or the side effects from that, I'm praying that God minimalizes, you know, that maybe I'll just forget things that I don't really know or need to know, you know, (laughs) facts about donkeys and cows and stuff. (laughs) You know, things like that. Uh, But, you know, there's all these plausible situations that could occur in the future. But every single one of them, if I think about it and imagine it, I will never suffer in any of these situations as much as my Savior suffered for me to save me. You know, God is so kind and gracious. He came down to this earth. God the Son came down to this earth and lived a perfect life and then was pierced and crushed for my sins. Like, who is this God that he is so good that he comes down and he saves sinful people like you and I, you know? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This truth that I will never suffer as much as Christ suffered for me and that I will never get what I deserve because Jesus got what he didn't deserve has sustained me during this time. The third truth that has sustained this this dying man is that Christians love one another. John 13, 35 says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Seeing the love of my brothers and sisters in Christ has moved me to tears on multiple occasions. When people have helped us or visited us in the hospital, I have felt so loved and have felt so much love for them. I didn't have emotions for, you know, the longest time, right? 
and three of my friends flew out just to help me. Um, and when I saw them, it was the first time that I started crying again after having the stroke, you know? And it was, it was amazing. It moved me to tears, just the love that my brothers and sisters showed us. Oftentimes, when they visited me, I would just be so filled with love that I'd just say to them, hey, I love you. And not everybody was, like, ready to say, I love you too, Matt, you know, because you don't throw those words out there willy-nilly. I understand that. But I was, you know, we were just so moved with love for all of the body of Christ, and we felt the love, we saw the love, we experienced the love, we ate the love as people brought food, in case, in case that sounded weird. I didn't write that down. <laughs> um. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1:25-26 says that there be, may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another if one member suffers all suffer together if one member is honored all rejoice together i never felt like we were alone in any of us so many people were there i mean i, I don't think i was there alone for a day in the hospital or anywhere the whole time there was you know i had fellowship i had friendship i had um, so many things um, I did feel and experience that when one member suffers, all suffer together. Thank you guys for suffering with us. I almost want to try and list by name everybody that was there, everybody that's helped us and loved us during this time. But the thing is, we can't. We can't list everybody by name. So many people have loved us throughout all of this and are doing things now that we don't even know. Um, Cameron's going to talk now and, as I take a break, and she's just going to talk about all the ways that people have loved us. So God really has provided in just uh, countless ways. And, and I'm not even going to, this is just going to scratch the surface of those ways. But for the sake of giving God glory, um, he just, here are some of the remarkable ways that, um, that he's provided for us. So right after um, Matt's diagnosis, when we were still in the hospital after the biopsy, <coughs> Um, one of our pastors came and told us that someone wanted to buy a home for us to live in. Because as I mentioned earlier, we, didn't, we were staying with a family from church, and we didn't have a place to live. Um, and so we were discharged on a Friday. We picked out a house that Tuesday, and it closed the following Wednesday. Um, and if that weren't enough, countless people from this church, from other churches who knew us, who didn't know us, stepped forward and said that they wanted to buy furniture. Because, again, we don't have anything here. It's all in Papua New Guinea. Um, and so our house was completely furnished, furniture and appliances. Um, the day we moved in, there was a stocked pantry and a stocked fridge and stocked closets. Um, people bought toys for our kids. Um, and, uh, and not only that, but we didn't, we didn't do anything to move ourselves into that house. Everyone moved us in completely without us having to do a single task, and that was the Saturday after the house closed. And even that timing was God's provision for us because just five days after we moved in, Matt had a stroke, and the kids and I had a home. Um, and that, that was just like God's provision in terms of this body working together to just show us love um, and love us during that time. God provided people to not just watch our kids over the last two months, but also homeschool our kids so that I could see Matt in the hospital. And he says, which was such a blessing to me, Cameron was my favorite person to see in the hospital. And... That's true. I said and, that. <laughs> All about for it. And I was able to see her almost every day because of the kindness and sacrifice of so many to watch our kids and homeschool our kids. Um, God provided people to go grocery shopping for me um, to clean or to come over and just clean our house so I didn't have to think about that. It provided meals upon meals, both in the hospital and to the kids and I at home. Um, he provided people to repair our car. He provided people um, to visit Matt in the hospital and to spend the night with him. Um, and so Matt doesn't remember a lot from the first few weeks in the ICU and following, but he never, never for a single night, the whole time he was in the hospital, did he ever spend the night alone. Someone was always spending the night with him to just be with him, which really was just such a kindness to me so that I could sleep at home. Um, 
We've received letters and gifts and clothes and checks from people that we know and people that we don't know. Um, God provided and has provided and continues to provide financial help and legal help and medical help um, and really just prayers beyond number. People have prayed. So many people have prayed and, and, and prayers have been answered in just miraculous ways. Um, so we are, we are just truly blessed to have brothers and sisters like you guys, like really just the body all around the world at this point. Um, it's been a privilege to live out the last two months and just to see that this truth of Christians loving one another during this time, and it has sustained me as well. And so, so many things that we don't even know about um, that are ongoing still, and, but for the things that we do know about and the, the things that Matt might not remember, I remember, and we do just want to say thank you. Um, and it has just been a privilege to see Christians love one another. Oh, I got one. I got one. I almost said this the Sunday that we spoke last time when we came up here and talked about how I had cancer. I'm generally very nervous to speak in front of people. The first time I led communion at DVC, I was so scared. Cameron can tell you. That whole week, all I could think about was speaking at church. But the Sunday I stood up to talk, to talk about our cancer, I wasn't nervous at all. But it was because I looked out and I was like, this is my family. You know, I don't get nervous speaking to my family. It is just like... God's love displayed through the body of Christ for us has sustained us during this time. But I want to list one person in particular that needs to be recognized. And I, I'll give some scripture to give it away. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears Yahweh is to be praised. I didn't practice, practice this part with Cameron, so she has no idea what I'm going to say. My wife has been a rock through all of this. You know, she has feared Yahweh and not feared her husband dying. Maybe we're a little afraid, but I think for the most part, <laughs> I think for the most part, she has feared Yahweh. And uh, God has shown her much grace and sustained her so well as she has had to watch her husband come near to death on multiple occasions and just being a solo mom for two months, you know? And needing to navigate insurance and finances and communication. I mean, Cameron, my wife is amazing. Proverbs 31, 10 through 12 says, An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. An excellent wife who can find. I found her. <laughs> She's right here. She is sitting next to me, and she has been next to me this entire time. I mean, praise God for the body of Christ. This, I mean, just God has sustained this dying man by the love that Christians show for one another. The last truth that has sustained this dying man is that God loves us. Ephesians 3, 18 through 19 says, that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It would have been enough to just be justified, to be adopted, to be able to go to heaven, but God loves us, right? I mean, he loves us. He has affection for us. I think about all the people that came and showed us so much love and it was so great to be loved, and it was so great to love, and yet God's love is so much greater than all this. Or we can think about all the ways that we have love with each other, you know, we, or we, we, we love each other. Um, a father's love, a mother's love, a brother's love, a sister's love, a, the love between a father, a father and a son. These are all really deep places of love, and yet again, God's love for us, is greater than all of these. It is incomprehensible. At the end of the day, God doesn't prove his love for us because I'm standing here now or because the cancer is shrinking. That love was proven at the cross. God loved us and sent his son to die for sinners. That's the kind of love that God displays. It's amazing. 
And this love is steadfast. It doesn't change. It's not like I've, I'm get, I've, I've gotten cancer because God hates me. It's still this love that God displayed at the cross that is behind every act in my life, everything that comes into my life. And it's this love that I will try to comprehend for all eternity. The fourth truth that sustained this dying man is that God loves me. God loves us. These last couple months were, again, the most, this is my conclusion, just to let you guys know. We're concluding now. We've finished the four points. We're the most difficult times of my life, and God so graciously sustained us with these truths. We have a hope in heaven. I will never suffer in this life as much as my Savior suffered for me. Or to put it another way, I will never get what I deserve because my Savior got what he didn't deserve. Christians love one another, and God loves us. But these are only four of the truths that sustained us. There are many more truths that we can talk about and praise God for. All these truths sustained us, sustained me, the dying man. But really, we are all dying men and women, right? We all will need to face death again or at some point. I mean, I am going to have to die someday still. We are all going to have to die someday. If you are here and you do not have a hope, if you don't know where you're going to go when you die, or if you're not sure where you're going to go when you die, know that God offers forgiveness for your sins. He, you can be saved right now by trusting in Jesus Christ. But you need, in order to be saved, you have to recognize that you need saving. You have to recognize that you're a sinner, that you've sinned against this God. And the only way to be right before him is to trust in the salvation that he has provided, which is in Jesus Christ, who came to earth and died so that he might save sinners. So again, you can, you can have a hope in heaven right now by trusting in Jesus Christ if you haven't. As God, God's word says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. And Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 states, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. It is very clear from Scripture, salvation is not by works, by any good thing that we could try to do or by, doing, or by being good people, but through faith, faith alone in the Son of God, Jesus Christ alone. You can still continue to pray for us. We are still not out of the woods. I still have stage four lung cancer. When I was in the hospital, and I'm like fighting so hard just to get my left side working, sometimes I'd forget, oh yeah, I still have cancer, you know? But I do, I still have cancer. And, but God has been so great to us throughout all of this. The cancer is shrinking, praise the Lord. And, um, but, but yeah, there's, so, but you can keep praying for us. I still had full brain radiation, which I talked about earlier, praying that the side effects aren't, that bad. Um, I'm still recuperating physically and mentally. But our biggest prayer in all of this is taken from Philippians. I'm going to kind of steal the Apostle Paul's words. It is our eager expectation and hope that we will not at all be at all ashamed, but that with full courage Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That really is our prayer in all of this, you know, that God would be honored in my body, whether by le life or by death. Because who knows? We, we still don't know what's going to happen. We're praying for life, but God could take me tomorrow and, or the next day, and we're just praying that God would be honored by my life or by my, by my death. There was a time in this where, where I thought, should I freak out about this? Should I be discouraged or scared or anxious? Cameron and I both had this conversation where we both had this like thought where it's like, I should probably be freaking out more, right? Or even depressed, right? Um, but my response was, how could I? How could I do any of these things when I know that these things are true? You know, we have a hope in heaven. Um, I have brothers and sisters who love me. I know the living God. Um, it, it, who has spoken and it came to pass, 
unless the Lord has commanded it. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? Lamentations 3, 37 through 39. I mean, this, this is true. I know what's true. We know that God's word is true. I feel like, like responding with depression or anything like that would be denying these truths, you know? It'd be like saying, I don't have a wife or kids. But that's not true. And I love my wife and kids. Why would I ever say something like that? So, you know, we know these things are true. And, I, and there's no way that we could ever deny them. Cameron, wait. Regardless of the circumstances on any given day, we are blessed beyond measure. Cameron and I kept saying throughout all this, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And every day that we said that, it was true. You know, every day is the day that the Lord has made. And there's so much to rejoice and be glad in. Do I have cancer? Yeah. Could I die? Sure. Right? Could it go really bad? Maybe. But do I know the one true living God? Yes. Do I have a hope in heaven? Yes. Will I ever suffer in this world as much as my Savior suffered for me on the cross? No, I won't, you know? Do I have brothers and sisters in Christ who love us? Yes, I do. Um, does God love me more than I could ever comprehend? Yes, right? So this is the day the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> don't, know how to, don't know how to conclude it. <laughs> yeah, praise God. What? Yeah.